Well, hello, hello, everybody. I'm so excited that you guys have joined us for uh, today for this second episode of our newest series, the newest collection of talks called Walking in the Wonder. And so you probably saw Chris's talk last week about worship, about what it means um, to worship and how who we worship, what we worship is so instrumental in our lives. If you don't know me, my name is Stephen, and I'm actually the worship leader for The Harbor. I have the blessing, honor, and privilege of leading this house of young adults and college-age students in, in worship, and it is the um, one of the biggest joys of my life. And so it's no coincidence that I'm up here talking about worship, but what I want to focus on today is primarily not what worship looks like in our corporate gathering with lights and music and intimate moments that we get to share, you know, as a church family with with God and with each other. But really, what does worship look like outside the four walls of the church? What does worship look like after the moment is over? What does worship look like as a lifestyle? What does it look like, sound like, feel like to live a worshipful life? I had the privilege of um, speaking about worship to the high school and middle school students here at Bay Hope Church. And I came up with a silly illustration to get you know the young people engaged or whatever um, about how life with Jesus, once we've been saved, life with Jesus is like taking a shower. What do you take a shower to do? You, you take a shower because you wanna get clean. Life with Jesus cleans us, right? We go into a situation, we go into a relationship with Jesus with all the muck, the mud, the mire, the, the grit and the grime from all of our yesterdays. And Jesus washes us clean, water, falls over our body and washes us clean. The Bible talks about Jesus being living water. But see, life with Jesus, okay, after you've come into a relationship with him, life with Jesus and living life with Jesus and not pursuing a a worshipful life is like taking a shower without soap. And now you're thinking like, all right, there's no way this guy's a worship leader because he's talking about nonsense. But hear me out, for centuries, for millennia, in fact, we didn't use soap when we showered. Mankind didn't. We went in streams or under waterfalls, whatever, and the water washes clean. And that was enough, really, to to clean you. If you go and take a shower right now without soap, you'll leave a whole lot cleaner than you were when you went in. The issue is you won't smell any different or look any different when you come out, right? The reason we use soap in the shower is so that when we leave that moment of being clean, we, we leave a fragrance, a trail everywhere we go. And what worship does, what l- pursuing a lifestyle of worship does is it leaves evidence of who we are in every room that we walk into. And this is my personal conviction that worship, living a lifestyle of worship, just like soap in the shower, it's what gives it the secret sauce, almost. It's what gives it a little more purpose. It's an actuating event that you actively participate in um, that gives something life. You see, the Bible says that faith without works is dead. Uh, In the book of James, it says faith without works is dead. When James says that faith without works is dead, he's not saying that if you're not doing good deeds and doing all these things that you have no faith. When he says dead, he means faith without works is inactive. It's stagnant. And if you know anything about water, sticking with the analogy of the shower, flowing water is beautiful for nature, beautiful for cleanliness, beautiful for a myriad of things, but water that is stagnant builds up mold and mildew and actually in rust and is detrimental to the container that it's holding it in. So for us to live a life of of, of faith, to have a relationship with Jesus, but not pursue worshiping Jesus with the entirety of who we are, what happens is the water, the living water that we hold onto is stagnant. And that's not good. You say, cool, Stephen, we get it. The worship's important, but what the heck does it look like? And how do I actually live this life of worship? And so I'd like to read for you a passage, a passage of scripture from the book of Romans. And if you don't know what Romans is, it's Paul, um, the Apostle Paul's letter to the church that he planted in Rome. And we're gonna be the last verse of Romans 11 and then the first two verses of Romans 12. And the last verse of Romans 11, verse 36, it reads like this. For everything comes from him, and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever, amen. I'm gonna read that one more time. For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever, amen. And so right here, what we learn, hypothetically, maybe those words are hard to believe, but in order for us to move on, we have to say that these, we have to acknowledge that these words 
are true. He says, for everything comes from him, exists by his power and is intended for her glory. So God is the initiator of all things, the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things. And from all the good that comes from that, he's also the benefactor. And so Paul closes out his chapter with this and then he starts his next chapter assuming that we can accept that truth as fact, as concrete. And he says this next, uh, the first ver- verse in chapter 12, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. It's not a suggestion. It's not a small request. It's not asking a favor, but it's pleading with you. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Verse two, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I'm gonna read verse two one more time. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Those verses have have, have, have greatly influenced the way that I look at life. Um, And after a lot of reading them over, a lot of meditation and and studying them, I kind of got angry when I found out what Paul was saying, okay? Because the the overall gist, if you were to dumb it down to one sentence, Paul is saying, hey, worship God, don't sin. Worship God, how do you do it? Don't sin. And you read that and you're like, cool, thanks, Paul. Glad for the help. Because isn't it, because of our human sin-stained fallen nature, isn't it impossible to live a sinless life as Jesus did? But that's the standard regardless. Paul says, hey, worship God. Don't sin, just just be perfect. Just live your life utterly and entirely as a sacrifice to God and don't sin. Don't ever, don't do anything wrong again. Don't conform to the patterns and behaviors of this world. So he calls us to an impossible standard. If we believe that the Bible is God breathed and this might as well be God speaking directly to us, he calls us to an impossible standard, an impossible task that you and I will never ever be able to live up to of our own volition. The beauty in that call is that God equips us with the things necessary to do that. And you say, Stephen, well, what do you mean? We got to look at it this way. In the book of Peter, uh, 1 Peter, God says that, or, or Peter writes in his letter that once we come into a relationship with Jesus, we're given the divine nature of Christ, meaning that we have now the same inclinations, the same uh, moral compass that Jesus has. And you say, if you don't believe me, well, you say, well, every time that you've ever done something wrong, I know every time that I've done something wrong, and boy, it is a long list. Every time that I've done something wrong, I've never done so thinking like, eh, this isn't wrong. You know that it's wrong and you can't help but know that it's wrong because we've been given the divine nature of Christ. Moreover, and I think Philippians, I wanna say Paul writes, he who knew no sin became sin so that you and I might be the righteousness of Christ. Jesus, who knew no sin, became the very embodiment of every sin that was, is, and will be ever committed so that you and I might become the righteousness of Christ. So Paul, Jesus speaking through Paul, calls us to this impossible standard, but then equips us with the things necessary to obtain it. And you're like, great, but why, does, why is this important for my life? Why, how does, what does this look like in action? What does this look like um, practically speaking? And, What does it look like practically, but how the heck do I do it? Because you're saying it's an impossible standard. We gotta look at John 10, 10. If you come to Bay Hope Church, you hear Pastor Matthew quote this verse all the time, that Jesus came so we may have life and life to the full. But what that scripture implies is that Jesus came so we have life. Yes, we have a pulse, but life to the full in the sense that there's more to life than just simply living. Jesus' life, his sinless life, Yes, it qualified him to be the propitiation. It's a fancy word for, for, for the payment. It qualified him to be the one true sacrifice for our sins so that we may accept the free gift of grace and forgiveness and live eternally. 
But moreover, while he was on earth, what it does is it illustrates for us, paints a picture for us of what our life ought to look like here on earth. The impossible standard once again. The beauty is he gives us righteousness and he gives us his nature in order to help us with that task. Moreover, it's in, it's in the, the sacrifice. It's in the turning, right? You look at what Paul says. He says, let them be a living and holy sacrifice. Well, what does it mean to sacrifice? It's, it's implied when making a sacrifice that you have to give something up, right? When Paul is saying don't sin, yeah, he's saying don't sin, but really what he's saying is, hey, look, you're gonna have to change your behavior a little bit. And it's not because of to be legalistic and, legalistic and say, hey, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. It's saying, hey, if you want life and life to the full, you're going to have to strive to live life like Jesus calls us to live life. Not so that we can be shamed, not so that we can feel like we're failing all the time, but so that we can have life and life to the full. That's what Jesus calls us to. And the reality is that is always, always in every circumstance, what's best for us. In my Harbor group, we just had a conversation um, about nobody lives life looking back and saying, you know what? I wish I would have trusted God less, right? So God's will for your life is what's best for your life. And to know that will, to close the distance between you and God, the way that we do that is through living a worshipful life. The way that we live a worshipful life is every day waking up with the intention and, and the, the effort and the striving to be a living sacrifice. And that means you have to give up some of your temptations. You gotta give up some of your tendencies and proclivities and inclinations and things that we hold near and dear to our heart, but sometimes we know that they're bad for us. And we know that God is calling us to give those things up. And giving those things up, that's worship. That's what it looks like outside of the four walls of the church to live a worshipful life. That is good and pleasing and perfect to God. And some of you may be watching this and you're like, Stephen, that is not encouraging because what you're saying is it's all on me. It's like, no, 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 no. You getting to heaven is all on Jesus. He did that all. If you've accepted the free gift of salvation, you, did, you can do that on your own. He did that for you because he's the only one true sacrifice that could have, could have paid the penalty. But getting heaven onto earth, the degree to which you experience the fruit and the, and, and the glory that is a relationship and, and, and the goodness and the mercy and the kindness, the degree to which you tangibly experience those things. Yeah, our behavior on earth has consequences. I heard an illustration one time sitting in small group when I was in high school, okay? And this, this, this guy who was, he, he was, he was uh, homeschooled and he dual enrolled. And so I was a senior in high school at the time, but he was like working on his doctorate or something crazy like that. Absolute genius, all right? And he was sitting, talking to all of a group of high schoolers and um, we're all kind of like, you know, stupid boys. We laugh and people say like duty, you know what I mean? But he, he starts explaining us this, this super complicated concept of, you know how, and he starts talking, he, he kind of has this like high voice, whatever, and he starts saying, you know, life with Jesus is like the solar system. And we're like, all right, we don't, like you said, solar system, we think science, and everybody checks out. We got no idea what you're talking about, okay? Life with Jesus is like the solar system and the way that the earth revolves around the sun. And you're like, dude, what are you talking about? We think about the sun because it's tilted on an axis, we experience seasons. And the way that uh, the, um, rotation around a centrical thing works is that the distance between the earth and the sun never changes. The only thing that changes was, is what part is facing him. That's why we experience wintertime and summertime because sometimes because of the tilt, when we go around the earth, parts are closer to him and parts are farther than him. Life with Jesus is like that in the sense that when we come into a relationship with Jesus, our proximity to him, our distance to him never changes. It's irrevocable, irreversible. Once he's got a hold on you, he's got a hold on you and there's nothing you can do about it because he's not letting go of you, right? But the, the way, the manner in which I'm facing him is dependent on my actions and dependent on the way that I strive to love and serve Jesus with my earthly body. See, sometimes I believe, and it's a, it is a great uh, tragedy and something that makes my heart ache is sometimes a lot of people, they come into a relationship with Jesus and they've been locked into orbit, right? But they live life in wintertime. They live life facing away from him. 
And the reality is when Paul says, be a living sacrifice, it's in the effort and the striving and the, and the, the determination and, and, and sometimes the perseverance it takes to turn, to turn, to try to turn. Because the reality is none of us are ever gonna experience the fullness of summertime here on earth because we can't be perfect, but it's in the effort to turn. It's in the striving. It's in the pushing. It's in the pulling. It's in the willingness that you and I have to give up of things to turn closer to Jesus so that we can face him. And before you know it, what's wintertime, what's in hibernation, what is dead and cold and damp and wet becomes summertime and the birds are chirping again and the flowers are blooming again and the grass is green and the sky is blue and we get to live life to the full. And how does that happen? It's by living a life of worship, by striving to live a worshipful life. And you say, Stephen, I'm, I'm still a little bit discouraged. Now, I read this passage of scripture to the students and it's in, I have it memorized, so oh, most of it memorized, so I'm not gonna flip through it in the Bible. I always hate when people do that. Um, there, there's a passage, passage of scripture that dra- drastically changed my life. It's in John 21. And it's the last, um, the last chapter of the gospel of John. And it's John's account of this moment where Jesus has breakfast on the, on the beach with the disciples. You know, they're, they're hopeless and they're, they're dejected because Jesus has already been crucified. He hasn't yet ascended to heaven, but he's already been crucified and he's dead. And we don't, they don't really know what's next. And so they go back to what they were doing, what they've been doing, and they go fishing. And they go fishing and they're not catching anything. And they hear a man call from the beach and he says, hey, did you catch anything? They say, no, fling your nets on the other side. And all of a sudden they hear it. He says, throw your nets on the other side. And they are immediately reminded of the time that they first met Jesus when they didn't catch a thing. And he says, throw their nets on the other side. So what, they, what do they do? They throw their nets on the other side and they catch so many fish they can't, even, they can't even get it onto the boat. And then they know, oh, that's Jesus. And so Peter, who denied Jesus three times, jumps off the boat, doesn't even, I mean, I imagine, unless he was an, a, a tremendously athletic swimmer, right? He's going slower than the boat, but because he's so passionate, he's swimming on the shore. And I imagine the other disciples are passing and I'm like, bro, we were going the same way you were going. You should have just stayed on the boat. And so he gets to the beach and they see Jesus and Jesus takes the fish in that they caught whatever and gives them almost like brunch on the beach. And it's quiet. They haven't said a word or whatever. And mind you, this is Peter who denied Jesus three times, leads the charge to go back to have breakfast with him. And Jesus, is, Jesus asked him a question. He says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And then he asked him a second time, Peter, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know I love you. And then he asked him a third time, Peter, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know I love you. See, in English, we only have one word for love, but in Greek, which is the language that the Bible was originally written, they have four words, agape, storge, eros, and phileo. Agape is the love that's unconditional and sacrificial in nature. And in its fullest form, it's only love that God has, it's only love that can be experienced from God to man. We can, can't agape love in its fullest capacity. And then there's another love that's used in this, in this encounter, phileo love, and it's friendly love. love. I delight in your presence kind of love. I love when you're around. I love to be in the same room as you. Twice, or Jesus says to Peter, do you agape me? Do you have sacrificial, unconditional love for me? And Peter says, you know I phileo you. You know I delight in your presence. You know I love to be in the room when you're in the room. And then what does Jesus say? He says, feed my sheep. And then the second time he asks, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. And he says, feed my sheep again. The third time, Jesus changed the question. He says, okay, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter says, Lord, I've said it three, twice already. You know I phileo you. You know I delight in your presence. And so Jesus says, feed my sheep. And what that passage of scripture outlines for us is the things that God expects, the things that God accepts. And regardless of our performance, we are never disqualified from our calling, from our divine purposes given to us by God. See, the last part of that scripture that we read in Romans 12 says, then you'll know his will for your life. It's never too late to turn and strive to be a living sacrifice to know God's will for your life. We serve a God who gives endless, endless second chances. He's, gonna, he's calling you to an impossible standard. 
giving you what it is you need to live up to that standard because he wants you to live life to the fullest. And that's what worship is. That's what living a worshipful life looks like and feels like. It's in the striving. It's in the turning. It's in the effort that it takes. It's in the perseverance. It's when it doesn't feel fun, when I'm going to be laughed at maybe, when I'm going to be excluded from whatever interaction, when I have insane FOMO because of what all my friends are doing, making sacrifices on behalf of the name of Jesus. That's what living a worshipful life looks like. And that's what I want for each and every one of you joining us today. Because there's been seasons of my life where, yeah, I've been in the wintertime, but there's been seasons of my life where I've been on summertime facing God. And it is a, a beauty and a glory and a peace and a love and a joy like none other. We don't have words to describe it. We can come up with them all day, but we'll never fully be able to describe the wonder and the glory that is living a life, walking with Jesus, walking in the wonder of who God is. That's for you. That's for you, each and every one of you. Let's pray. God, I love you so much. And I'm so, so thankful for your cross and for your grace and for your mercy and for your love and for your kindness and what it means for our life. And so God, I pray that this week, um, that this month, this year, whatever the timetable may be, God, that you would lay on our hearts something that we need to sacrifice to you, something that's inhibiting us from being closer to you, inhibiting us from recognizing you, Jesus. And God, I pray that you'd give us the strength and the courage to let it go, that you'd give us the faith to believe that your way is the best way, that you have our best interest at heart, God. We pray all these things in your wonderful, wonderful and mighty name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, well, thank you for joining us. If you're not in a group, join a group, DM us. We'll hook you up with a harbor group. We love you guys so much, and we will see you next week.